Over the years, I've realized what is best for me to do and what isn't. I think that a lot of uh, general dentists get in this and because Invisalign looks like magic, it truly like it's amazing that plastic can do this. Um, they get in over their heads a little bit and I can see why some orthodontics get upset. Hello, Patrice Rati. I'm Jazz Galassi and welcome to another episode in this orthodontic month. This episode is focused on Invisalign and elastics. Like one of my most uh, popular episodes before was IPR, like getting into IPR and, and the nuances of that. And I feel as though one of the biggest pain areas of dentists who are getting started with a line of treatment or even experience with a line of treatment is using elastics. Now, whether it's to extrude lateral incisors which is the way that I learned to use elastic with liners or to use them in an intermaxillary so from uh, across the arch so for example class 2 or class 3 elastics we're going to cover that with someone really cool his name is Dr. Robin Bethel he's based in the US he runs the Facebook group Aligner Nation which is just phenomenal like you guys should totally follow it if you're not part of that already and I'm going to ask him the nitty gritty details. Now, this episode is an amalgamation or a marriage of part one and part two, because when we first recorded, it was going really well, but then there was a storm in Texas of all things. And this storm in Texas meant that we had to cut short because he was having signal issues. So we rearranged and a few weeks later, we sort of did take two. But the biggest shocking thing you might hear today is the fact that actually, should I ruin it, should I not? Should I continue, should I continue saying what I'm saying? Okay, fine, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the spoiler, okay? But there's more to it in this episode, I promise you. But Robin basically said that the wealth of evidence that we have and the position statement we have is that intermaxillary elastics, like class two and class three elastics, they don't really add very much into your aligner treatment. So that was a massive shocker because, you know, every time I have a guest on a podcast and I prepare like three or four questions, my first question was, okay, tell us about uh, elastics and aligners. And then the second and third and fourth question was like the nuances. Okay, which ones do you use for class three and elastics and how do you stage it and that kind of stuff. But can you imagine how shocked I was when uh, after the first question, he says, no, don't bother using it. I haven't used it for three years. I was like, what? So that's crazy. The protrusive dental pearl I'm gonna share with you is a video technique. Like the most commonly asked question I get sometimes based on the IPR episode is, hey Chance, can you just like make a video of IPR? And I never get around to doing it. Uh, Cause that was like a big pain area when I was starting um, using burrs for IPR. Like as a general dentist, like I love enamel. We all love enamel, right? And we want to be as uh, conservative as possible. So when I got to terms of using a mosquito burr, I was really worried initially as, oh my gosh, you know, I've seen some uh, example radiographs for where it's just gone totally wrong, right? So I'm going to share with you uh, the guest who I have today, Dr. Robin Bethel, his Dr. Robin Bethel Texas IPR technique, which is basically using a red mosquito burr. And it's just the way he does it. Like if you're starting IPR with burrs, if you watch this video, it will give you a bit of clarity. And you still need to use magnification. You still need to be careful, I think. But sometimes by watching someone else do it, but, and the video is good enough quality that I think you get the gist of it. Essentially, it's using the burr in a certain way and then doing the rest of it in what he uses a space file uh, sort of strip. And you can use any sort of IPR strip you want, but you open up the embrasures with the burr and then the final bit of enamel, you use the IPR strip. Hopefully, I'll get to video it one day as well, but since Dr. Robin Bethel, our esteemed guest today, has already done that hard work for us, I'll be more than happy to share that. Uh, so, Dr. Robin, thank you so much for all this amazing content that you make. I'm so stoked that we have him on today so this was done live guys so so excuse any shout outs uh, and again if you like the live stuff i'm doing do check out the the facebook facebook page which is a protrusive dental podcast facebook page if you're not already following the instagram it's at protrusive dental so i'll catch you in the main episode and i'll see you in the intro thank you dr robin bethel you're based in texas i believe uh, we've never met before but i appreciate you so much for agreeing to do this because what you've set up with the Aligner Nation community is just brilliant. I've been practicing this line for about uh, four years now, and yours has been the best resource for Aligners. I've, I've found some of your videos, your energy on there, your level of education. It's just, it's just great. So uh, thank you to, for, for producing all that stuff. But tell us a bit about yourself, where you practice, how you got into Aligners, and how you've become one of the top um, Invisalign providers in, in the U.S., I believe. Man, that's a killer intro, and thank you. Um, yeah, I am in Texas. I went to school in San Francisco at University of Pacific. I was trained in aligners by Robert Boyd back in 2006, and I became a uh, Invisalign provider. I'm going to say that in quotes because there's not a high standard in the United States to become an Invisalign provider. You just take a weekend course and they uh, say you're ready to go, teach you how to take impressions. It's the same in the UK? Yeah. And that's it's, uh, part of the great thing about aligners in this era and also the problem 
and that we are so naive to how they work, biomechanics, tactics, and there's not a lot of uh, literature, clinical literature to support a lot of the things we're taught. And so we're kind of in this new frontier. We're, we're um, discovering things as we're going. And I was definitely trained in orthodontic fundamentals, and that gave me a foundation to go out and feel confident in treating people with aligners. And I was, let's just say, rudely awakened. My first case was my father, and um, it went... Your first aligner case or your first orthodontic case, like with the fixed appliances? Aligner case, yeah. It was my, my dad, and it went terribly wrong. Uh, I trusted that... Tell us, give us the details. What, what went wrong? What was, is it the classic uh, posterior open by afterwards? What, what was it? A little bit of everything. My, my biomechanics setup was, was awful. I, I trusted the Invisalign Assist program at the time. You, you submit a, your impressions and they give you a clin check and you're supposed to you know, submit a new impression every four to six weeks. And um, he was a class two crowding case. And I had everything from elastics, buttons on every teeth. And I just said, here, we're gonna trust the system. I had no idea you know, what was gonna happen and it did not work. Teeth didn't track, canines didn't rotate, elastics did nothing. And in the end, he just burnt out and stopped and his teeth just went back to where they were. But at least he was your dad and he can't sue you, right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, it taught me a lot. It taught me a lot. And then, you know, in 2014, I treated him again and we got him lined up. His teeth look better than ever. He's never had aligned teeth before. He's very grateful for it. Brilliant. So you, you, what you shared there, very, very nicely, very nice of you to share a failure. It's, it's so human of you to share that. Uh, and I think with aligners, beginners can make this mistake. Uh, I remember the first time I got a clincher back, I didn't know what to do. I was like, okay, this looks pretty good. Does that mean it's, it's good to go? So that's a classic uh, mistake for a beginner to make. And then when you learn that, hey, actually, the person at the end of it who's engineering everything is not a dentist. You are responsible and you are in charge. Uh, and I think you've been on that journey. And I think uh, what you're sharing now with everyone on the Aligner Nation group and stuff, some of the videos you make, I think you made one that said like crushing clincher right. and stuff, which I love the title. Uh, and it's honestly your, your energy and your vibe and you're really um put yourself out there as, as a great educator and liners for me i'm so excited to because most of my i mean about 70 to 80 audience is uk based so for those guys in the uk i know you're gonna love uh, robin's content so robin we're gonna, we're gonna dive in uh, to the main theme of today's episode which i'm so grateful to have you for is elastics right so i've been doing aligners for about four years but i know i'm gonna learn so much from you about elastics because um, a lot of my peers don't know much about uh, elastics when it comes to the use of elastics in uh, a line of treatment. So uh, it'd be great to get the main fundamentals. So if we start with the basic question, what percentage of your patient, uh, Robin, are you prescribing elastics for? It's a great question. And it's a very important question. In my cases, um, and I treated last year over 700 cases, uh, less than 10% are in elastics. And there's a really good reason for that. And not that there are 10% of my cases are skeletal class one or class two or class three. It's it's that elastics, when used with aligner systems, are only useful and predictable um, when they're moving specific vectors or specific teeth and specific vectors. They are not useful. And the American Board of Orthodontics published their, excuse me, the AAO published a study in November 2020 saying that, that the success rate and the ABO success of class two treatment with uh, elastics in uh, Invisalign aligners is really bad, like less than 20% success. Wow. So elastics to treat a class two case, a skeletal problem, don't do it. Elastics to, uh, you know, extrude a tooth that's not tracking properly or to, uh, to give anchorage to um, the molars while you're moving the anterior segment distally, that, that can be done and that can be helpful and it provides a, a specific force system to allow you to achieve those movements. But the main takeaway with elastics is you have to know your diagnosis. And you got to look at the patient's face. You're not going to change a patient's skeleton by putting a rubber band between an upper and lower arch that's wrapped in plastic. Well, if, in these class two cases, then, uh, if you're saying that the success rate of these elastics is not so good, so you, you know, using class two elastics, do we just rely on the aligners to do their bit within reason and then the elastics is an unnecessary step? I would say globally. Or do you just use them anyway? No, I don't use them. If they're not going to provide a benefit, I don't use them. And globally, there people are prescribing them unnecessarily. I see it all the time. I think many ClinChecks go through the algorithm, and everyone has to know that Invisalign, there's there's two tracks that your your cases go through. First, they go through an algorithm. Basically, the computer makes a, a line down the center of 
axis of a tooth, and then it makes all those teeth parallel, and it lines them up, and it does it in a matter of seconds. It's just a computer algorithm. And then it goes to a technician, and they read your preferences, and they try to modify that algorithm to fit your preferences, and then it comes back to you in the form of a clinch check. Zero percent of those are right the first time in my practice. So if you have a, you know, an algorithm that makes a class two person with the maxillas out here into a class one person, um, the algorithm will kick on elastics. It will automatically put class two elastics on. It will put a, a little uh, cutout on the canine and it'll put a little uh, cutout on the molar or a, a slit that you can hook elastics to. And what you're assuming, what the uh, algorithm is assuming, is that you're going to advance the mandible with the use of elastics. And we know that that in a, in a non-growing patient doesn't happen. Certainly doesn't happen mm -hmm. predictably. Now, someone that's growing, yeah, the mandible could grow forward, but that's a surgical case. And if the maxilla, if you do a cephalometric analysis and you determine that the maxilla is protrusive, it's too big, you're not going to get the whole maxilla to, you know, come back by putting on some 100 or 200 gram elastics on a case. Now, if you have a blocked out canine, a three that's, you know, you didn't have room for it, and you push the teeth out, you expand the arch by tipping the crowns and you make room for it, and then you hook an elastic on that canine, and you anchor it, and you put 100 or 200 grams of force on it to pull it down, that will certainly help get the canine to come down. So those kind of cases I use elastics for to uh, close down a bite. So more, I'm getting more local factors rather than for what we traditionally would have thought, you know, class three elastics, class two elastics. So that's uh, that's the take home there, basically, that actually they're, that they are over prescribed maybe by um, the ClinChecks, and they maybe have more of a role in, in localized movements. Is that, is that a fair way to put it? I think it's an excellent way to put it. I think that I use them in localized movements only. And if, for example, a great question is, uh, you know, you got a posterior open bite where either bilateral or unilateral, you got molars and bicuspids not touching, and people will come back and they'll, I see these ClinChecks where they have attachments on every tooth or button cutouts on every tooth, and they're trying to close down the posterior, that's an incorrect use of elastics as well. And I think that what you really have is an anterior interference. And if you can get the interference out, the mandible will auto-rotate, and then you'll get the teeth to come together. It was a poor diagnosis and so, poor So that planning. was actually one of the questions that um, um, I'd emailed to. I just want to set the scene for this. So yeah. one common thing, it's, it's definitely happened to me, and it's happened to so many people, right, oh, yeah. where you finish a case, it's, it's typically going to be um, a class three tendency case where they got crowding and then you resolve the crowding. And then what you didn't get enough of was overjet because overjet is king. So you didn't get enough overjet. And please correct me, Robin, because I trust you far more than I trust myself when I'm saying this. OK, so overjet is king. You don't have enough overjet. And because just like you said, you have that interference, you have this posterior open bite. This is not because the aligners were intruding the molars, whereas, you know, to the extent it's more because you have that interference. If you create more overjet, you get rid of the interference. So what some people do is they will, like you said, put buttons and use elastics like box elastics to extrude it. But what you're saying is that actually, even in that scenario, let's ditch the elastics and let's actually deal with that interference. Is that a fair way to say it? It's exactly how to say it. And the, the main point to uh, you know, using Invisalign or whatever aligner system that you use is you've got to know your diagnosis. You got to know, you understand why before you start trusting a computer screen, which is just teeth floating in space in a theoretical system. And I think uh, once people accept that responsibility, Invisalign gets a lot better, a lot more fun. Well said, well said. In the, in the UK, a popular approach, and in Europe actually, just a, a side note, a popular way to approach that situation where maybe you have got a bit of a, a posterior overbite. Now, I'm not talking about a crazy amount. I'm talking about less than a millimeter yeah. is that some clinicians will cut the distal of the canines for the lower uh, for the lower aligner and allow like some dial type movement or over eruption of the the, the lower sort of premolars and beyond uh, and then maybe four weeks later to then just uh, retain at that level is there a place for that in your practice have you seen that work do you know anything about that kind of way of resolving it absolutely and again that works if you have your diagnosis correct if you have somebody that has a prognathic mandible, and you know they have that uh, square-shaped jaw. Their mandibular plane angle is not very high, and you just cut the elastics, expecting for the molars to super up. It won't happen. And, and so people were like, "Oh, that doesn't work." Well, it would work if you had your diagnosis correct. There is this 
theme and this concept. And, you know, I don't even like using this term because it's not been proven, but we think that plastic causes passive intrusion of the molars. Now, if a, if a patient who has a steep mandibular plant angle, maybe that dolicofacial profile that we see where, you know, long face and they have steep, maybe they're class two, and they have more force on their molars because the molars hit first and you add a quarter millimeter of plastic to them, thus increasing the force on the molars. Um, yeah, yes, you could get some intrusion forces on those molars. Yeah, so they get more force on their molars, uh, an intrusive force, and the aligners will actually intrude the molars. And then if you cut the aligners within a day, the molars erupt back and you get occlusion on the molars. So when you have a patient back in your chair and you notice they have a posterior open bite, you have to do some analysis. There's a lot of different ways to check and, and understand. There are four different types or four different causes for posterior open bites. In the most common sense, it is, uh, or the, the most likely sense, it's an anterior interference. You try to uncrowd the uh, anterior without the overjet, and now you're just hitting in the front. Or you were trying to correct a class two person, and you had, you had this expectation that um, you know the mandible was going to move, or the maxilla was going to move, or a, a class three tendency patient and you didn't get any skeletal movement because you're not going to get any skeletal movement. And then now the patient's just occluding on their anterior teeth. Or you didn't achieve the anterior intrusion. You didn't level the, the occlusal plane like the ClinCheck showed. And now you're still in deep bite, but the anterior teeth hit. That's usually that's the most common posterior bite. And cutting your liners to fix that won't fix it. They have to have that. Well, I like to think about it is when I'm doing the dial concept, essentially it's sort of using that. But if the patient doesn't have any eruptive um, potential yeah. in the area, yep. it, it's never going to happen. It's a bit like a, a patient with an anterior open bite. Right. Why don't their anterior teeth just over naturally and, and meet? Because they don't have that uh, potential to. So I think it's a great way to put it. Uh, I'm going to just go to the next uh, elastic question, yeah. which is the most common use of elastics I have ever had to do, which is for those pesky lateral incisors. So quite commonly, they will not track anymore. So I want to ask you any tips for laterals not tracking or we just got to accept that that's the way it is and laterals will always be uh, annoying and pesky in that nature. And can you just talk through and describe how someone might go about um, the first time they, they encounter this, what the steps are involved in extruding a lateral incisor using elastics? That's a, a great question. And it's one that we get all the time. And yes, uh, laterals can be very pesky with aligners. They're like, trying to grab a wet watermelon seed. They're slippery, they're small, they're not a lot of surface area. <laughs> um, the extrusive force on a lateral incisor. First, the biggest tip I have when diagnosing whether or not a lateral needs to extrude, look at the CEJ. Is the CEJ of the lateral incisor where it should be in the face? A lot of these clinchecks, they will move, they'll extrude the laterals to make the incisal edges even with the centrals, when in fact, the best diagnosis to me is get the CEJs level with the centrals or even a little bit uh, a little bit lower than the centrals. And then you could bond or add length because the, the size of the lateral is the problem, not the position of the lateral. Biggest tip I have is don't extrude laterals that don't need to be extruded. That's number one. And when you have to extrude a lateral- That's very predictable. Yes. <laughs> Then you have to extrude a lateral. Um, I'm really, really like the smart attachments. There's uh, John Morton research in the G7 series of uh, attachments. They made this really large, active, it looks like a smiley face. It's called a um, optimized support attachment. And you put that on the facial of an aligner, or excuse me, the facial of a lateral incisor. And it really helps the plastic engage that active surface. There's a little dimple on it, and you will get a lot of eruptive you know, incisal vector of force on that tooth to help. And if you still can't get it, you can use elastics. And I've used the bootstrap technique with some success. And a bootstrap technique is basically you cut the aligner on the facial, you put a little button. I like these clear buttons that you can buy on Reliance Orthodontics. You put a button on the tooth and then you have slits and you cut little slits into the back of the aligner and you put an elastic, a, a, a high force, small elastic. Where I was going with that is I hooked the elastic to the front of the attachment, the, the button that we put on, on the front of the tooth and I wrap it around the aligner and then I hooked the elastic onto these little slots I cut out of the aligner on the back and I call that a bootstrap. And it applies and it adds another 50 grams of force to pull that or extrude that uh, lateral incisor. I've had some success with that. 
The question I want to ask is, um, on the, the fine detail, is on the back, on the lingual or the palatal part of the aligner, are you making like an L shape? Is it an L shape that you're making? No, I actually, uh, I cut two little slits that look like a little V. So the last, or the, so mm -hmm. if you imagine uh, you're on the, the palatal part and this is the incisal edge and I'm looking at the paddle, I cut like a slot this way and a slot this way and I hook the elastic around that and it kind of cinches down and it holds on to the, it's the lingual. And then it wraps around to the front and hooks onto the button. Okay. Welcome for part two, Robin Bethel. It's so, so great to have you on, Doctor. Um, how are you today? I'm doing great. Can you hear me? I can hear you just fine. A little bit of a lag, but I think we can uh, we can cope with that. Um, hearing you well, though, and, and, and looking great. Um, so last time there was a storm. There was a storm in Texas, uh, and then we had to abandon. But uh, the initial bit, you gave a lot of value, so I know people will be coming back to, to join this part. So we're going to spend the first five, ten minutes just recapping what we covered in the in the, in the take one, uh, and then we're going to wrap it up with the, the take two. Uh, but just remind everyone, okay, Robin, a little bit about your background, how you got into aligners, uh, and what you love about um, aligners. And are you? And I didn't actually ask you this. Are you limited to aligners, or do you do fixed as well? I didn't actually ask that last time. Well, now I'm just doing aligners in our general dental practice. But I started out doing fixed and aligners uh, for many years, and I, I love orthodontics. I, I somehow feel like I should have been an orthodontist, um, but I love using orthodontics as a part of comprehensive dentistry now, and. I, I work really well, collaborate with other orthodontists for a lot of cases because really uh, orthodontics is um, it's the foundational part for setting people up for a lifetime of oral health. And it's a little bit uh, too much to do everything all at once. So we kind of focus on the stuff that I can do efficiently and I work with orthodontists for the things that they can do efficiently and better than me. That's a really good point. And we, we might touch on that actually about um, maybe towards the end, we'll touch on, okay, where is the limit? of aligners because I, I seen some of your cases and I think, well, no way can you do that with aligners and, and you seem to be pushing boundaries along with a lot of other doctors are really pushing boundaries of aligners. So it would be interesting for me to find out maybe towards the end about what is, where does uh, Dr. Robin Bethel draw the line in the sand, right? So that would be really cool to know. I think everyone will, will want to know that, but let's pick up where we left off. You threw an absolute uh, bomb on the last episode uh, where we, we started because you absolutely shocked me because here I was the three or four questions I had written down and you almost erased all my questions because when I, when I asked you, is there much value in using intermaxillary elastics in Rizline? You said... I said no. <laughs> um, it's It confirmed suspicions from uh, many years of using Invisalign aligners and uh, AAO published a paper uh, in October of this year basically saying that um, elastic use to correct skeletal sagittal plane movements is not effective, not advisable. So, so you don't do it, just to recap, you, you don't use intermaxillary elastics for class twos or class threes uh, at all, or do you, do you still do it because it makes you feel warm and fuzzy and good inside? I do not do it at all, not even once anymore. In the last three years, I use elastics, but I use them for um, other things, which we'll get into, but not for class two, class three movements, no. That's crazy. Well, so, someone asked last time, hey, do you, do you use it in this situation or that situation? So someone asked last time, do you use it in these mild class three situations to help to retract the lower incisors? But the answer is no, because you just said it. The answer is no. That's that's crazy, right? That's crazy. Uh, literally, I, I, I used some uh, elastics about probably, probably three or four weeks ago, just before we uh, had that episode. Uh, and I felt as though, okay, I'm helping here. I'm helping. But there we are. You've told us that it, it doesn't work. And I've seen the cases you do. And if you haven't used intermaxillary elastics in three years, then that's something to be said about about that so there we are guys elastics in terms of the you know the intermaxillary ones the ones that go you know between canine to molar molar to canine that kind of stuff we're not using it so much and and, and there's no uh, significant evidence for efficacy i think that's what robin is trying to say so let's get on to when you do use aligners now we touched on extruding laterals and we will just recap the technique a little bit because you know as dentists we love the nitty-gritty details of exactly which which elastic to use how long to use it for we love those minute details but um, other than extruding laterals which other scenarios do you use elastics for in Invisalign or with aligners? You know, I like to keep it simple with aligners, um, make it as predictable as possible. And I think the number one use of elastics and aligners in my practice is for vertical movements, intruding or extruding a tooth. And usually it's a single tooth, not an entire arch. Now I've seen some doctors do entire arches by placing mini implants or TADs. Like for example, if they want to impact the maxilla, move it up, they'll place TADs and they'll use elastics from the buckle across to the lingual and an aligner to intrude an arch. Dr. Frost does this with Damon brackets. It can be done with aligners, but you're getting into some really un, 
charted waters here when you start doing that. But what I like to do is if I have a single tooth, like a lateral incisor that I'm trying to extrude, and it actually needs to be extruded, and I make that need based on a facial diagnosis, but I'll put a little button on the cervical third of a tooth, and I'll either bootstrap it, so take the button, put an elastic on, wrap it around to the lingual, and attach the lingual over an aligner to pull it. And I'll, I'll share with you the specific elastic that I use for that. Or even more effective is a cross arch where I'll put a little hook on the lower, uh, like a triangle style. So I'll put a one hook on, for example, if I'm trying to move number 10, I'll put a little hook on like 23 and a little hook on 22. And I'll make a little triangle with a um, 3 8 inch uh, five ounce elastic and get some forces to pull that tooth down. So, so those are both techniques in, uh, for example, that you could use in extruding a like single lateral or a single canine. Like, uh, and when would you use the bootstrap technique? Whereby uh, we're going to get a little bit more into that uh, with the nitty gritty details. But when would you use the bootstrap? And when we use this uh, the second technique you mentioned, whereby you're going uh, intermaxillary? Well, you're going to get a lot more force intermaxillary. Um, and you know, bootstrapping, you got to think that elastic needs to be stretched out for it to generate force. And a bootstrap, you're only moving it maybe I don't know. 10, centi or 10 millimeters to go from the buckle across to the lingual. And if you're using a cross arch, you can get that 22, 30 millimeters of uh, stretch to get the forces you need to generate an extrusive force. Um, you know, D Dr. Sandra Kahn, she published a, a book and she talks a lot about elastic use in that book, how to pull down those pesky laterals and canines and things. And she's a big advocate of cross arch. I've used cross arch, I've used bootstrap, for a canine, I wouldn't use a bootstrap because you need to generate 100 grams, 200 grams of force to get a canine to extrude. Anyone who's tried to do the, you know, the chain on a wire technique, you know, you got to keep that wire tight. And if you don't do it tight, it's not going to budge. So I wouldn't recommend doing a bootstrap on a, on a canine, but a little lateral with little, you know, little roots, you can bootstrap and get a millimeter or two of extrusion. And I've had some success, but it's less predictable than cross arch. Thank you very much, Robin. So uh, just for those people listening, we did cover a little bit about bootstrap last time. So uh, one, one way I've done it in the past, and I, I quite like the bootstrap way better that, that Dr. Robin described, is that the way I've done it in the past is on the front, we have a button, just like uh, Dr. Robin suggested. But on the back, I made like a almost like a L or a T shape inside where your uh, elastic can slot into. But the bootstrap, i.e. it actually looks like a bootstrap. So you make a little cut like this and like this, like a triangular, uh, and then you allow the elastic to, to grip onto it. Tell me if I've perversed it in any way, uh, Robin. Uh, but Perfect. Uh, that that makes like an it's like easier cut to do. It makes a lot of sense. Um, so which el elastic are you using? I think you mentioned before, or you haven't. Just just tell us which is the elastic we need to buy. Because and it's funny with elastics, they they're named after countries, they're named after animals. Uh, so we get really confused uh, with the different brands. You see? That's right. Yeah, Ormco does the animals. Uh, you can get them on plaque smackers with different types of animals. Um, really, what you want to look at for a bootstrap, you want a small elastic. Now. It, the smallest that you can find is 1 8 inch. They're hard to find. The more common small size you can get is 3 8 inch. And, um, you know, you can get up to quarter inches and things like that for cross arch. But you never want to use a really big one on a bootstrap. So you want to use a small one so you can stretch it out. Um, you can find a 1 8 inch or um, they probably do metrics too in other areas. But we use the inches in, in the United States. But you can use a, a 1 8 and a, like a 3.5 or a 4.5 ounce. The bootstrap, you also want a small elastic. You, because you're trying to loop it around to the lingual, you don't want to have rubber band between the plastic and the tooth creating friction. You want it to be as small as possible. So a light elastic, small light elastic is the best way to go. That's really good. I didn't. I never even really considered that. So that that's a good little call there. Thank you. Uh, I'm just going to. What I'm going to do? That. I'm going to check the because I'm going to encourage any questions coming in. I've got a few more questions on myself to ask as well. But if anyone's got any questions uh, about that, uh, do ask away. So I'm just going to open up the live on here. So no one sent any questions just yet. So that's fine. You can keep going. So fine. You've covered that. Um, let's talk about the button. So when you put the button um, on the labial surface of the lateral incisor, you're drilling away or cutting away uh, the cervical third area. Uh, is there a preferred button that you like? Because uh, I've heard, actually, some dentists, what they do is they use um, an elastic module, fill it up with flowable composite to, to make the sort of shape of it. In my hands, that doesn't seem to work so well. I actually like to buy the buttons. But which buttons do you recommend? Yeah, I like to use the, the little metal ones. Even if it's a, a lateral incisor, I'll still use the metal buttons. I buy them from a, a website called Plaque Smackers. 
Why? Because uh, it's they're easy. Reliance Orthodontic makes them too. You don't have to have a uh, an account signed up like with Henry Shine Ortho or Ormco to buy them. You can just buy them online. I didn't expect you to say that with the with the metal, but there we are. Yeah, you're coming through fine. Uh, are, you, are you using a self cure adhesive or um, well, I guess with the metal you probably well, there's not that much distance. So you probably could get away with the, using a light cure adhesive, but I imagine you're using a self cure adhesive, right? You know, I use a, it's a light cure adhesive. I mean, it's composite. You etch and bond, and you uh, use a resin composite, just a bracket glue, and you light cure it. Excellent. So, so we know which uh, elastic we're using. We know that it's just about 3.5 ounce or, or, or not something not so heavy because uh, you want you create that friction with a heavier elastic. So that makes sense. Uh, sorry about the lag, guys, by the way. There's a little bit of lag, but we're, we're still getting through the questions quite nicely. So the next thing to talk about is um, posterior open bites, which is like one of the most common things we might see for, for a newbie. It's happened to me before. It's, I've seen it in other people's cases before. We see it posted on Align a Nation a, a lot now and again. It's like, ah, guys, what do I do? I've got a posterior open bite. And we sort of touched on it last time where it's usually an issue with the diagnosis at the beginning. Uh, and we can definitely touch on that. I'd like to learn a bit more about that from you. But, but tell us, when we are at that situation, A, how do you prevent it in terms of diagnosis? B, when it does happen, is there a place for using box elastics to correct it? Or do we need to go back to your additional liners and actually do some more IPR on the lower incisors or correct it? But you, you tell me what you, what you think is the best way. There is a best way for each type of posterior open bite, but you have to know why you have a posterior open bite. You know, the four most common reasons. Uh, number one is you have anterior inference, which is usually you try to intrude the lower incisors as a deep bite case and you're uncrowding and you end up with anterior interference and now the back teeth aren't touching. No box elastics are going to fix that. I'm sorry, it's just you're, you're going to be trying to extrude both arches to touch together in the back. It's not going to work. And, you know, I don't necessarily know that you'd want it to work. If you have a posterior open bite caused by some passive intrusion or some iatrogenic intrusion of the molars, sure, maybe a little uh, box elastic will work, but you know what people like to do is cut the elastics, allow the molars to erupt or settle into occlusion. It's a much better scenario. And you can test for this by checking with bite paper at the end. If you only have anterior contacts from, you know, from three to three on the anterior, you're not going to want to... Um, you know, try to let the molars passively erupt. Now, if you have a single tooth interference, you check with bite paper, it's like only on 22 or 27, then I'll go into the clinch check and I'll remove the interference by moving the teeth. And then you'll see the teeth settle back then together with a, just the rotation of the mandible. Um, so it just depends on the type. So I went through, I, I briefly just touched on the two types of passive intrusion and an anterior interference. The other common cause of a posterior open bite is iatrogenic movement unwanted movement of the molars. You program in a translation, mesiodistal of a molar, you know, you're trying to collect a skeletal class, uh, let's say you're doing a class three and you're trying to distalize the molars, but instead of them translating, they're just tipping back and you end up tipping them out of occlusion. Same thing with buccolingual translation. Instead of them translating buccolingual, because there's no bone there, you did the wrong diagnosis, you ended up tipping them and then you tip them out of occlusion. The only way to fix that is tip them back into occlusion. I don't think that boxing elastics to get your molars to touch thin is the best way to go. Does that make sense? It does. You've succinctly covered all those four types, and I love that. And it's really impossible without knowing exactly which diagnosis it is for your patient to actually figure out exactly which of those four techniques might work. But am I right in saying that perhaps the, the passive intrusion might be one of the most common iatrogenic uh, sort of um, types that we see? Yes, and let me, I, I like talking about this, and I've talked about this a lot in the orthodontic community. We say, we call it passive intrusion. That might not really be what's going on. I mean, we, I was thinking for a long time, for the longest time, I wondered what was causing this. Ever since 2016, when we switched over to the new, uh, more elastomeric plastics, away from the, uh, the older, thicker plastics that Invisalign used to have, we saw a lot more posterior open bites. And I was thinking maybe it's because the molars are pounding on the plastic, iatrogenically intruding them. But it, in retrospect, it may not be the case. We don't know if it's from molars occluding and pushing the extra quarter millimeter of stretchy plastic is just pushing the molars in. We don't know if it's that. Or we have so many deep bite cases now when we're trying to intrude the, the molars, we're actually causing an equal and opposite force in the posterior that's 
in causes other movements we don't want. You're pushing down the front instead of the, the front action moving. The molars are doing something iatrogenically as well. We don't really know what causes this effect, but we do know that a lot of these cases, we don't put bite ramps on them. We were ending up with, you know, quarter millimeter of open bite in the posterior, really light. So it's hard to say exactly what causes this, but we think we've talked a lot about it being from the molars hitting and occluding and pushing the the uh, plastic is pushing the teeth in, intrusively. Yeah, it's tough to say uh, what exactly causes this, but using bite ramps is the prevention, and it's really common. Brilliant. So that's the, the golden nugget there to try and use uh, bite ramps when appropriate to, to help pre to prevent that, which, which makes complete sense. Uh, but in that situation, I've heard my colleagues, some colleagues advocate the following technique. So just let me know what you think about this following technique. So when you have that situation uh, and you'd like the, the posteriors to couple a bit better because they're, they're just slightly uh, pulling the, the articulating paper to cut the distal of the lower canines of the aligner uh, and give it around about four to five weeks. Um, is that okay or is that risky? I don't think it's risky. It really works. It doesn't take four weeks. If you've compressed the ligament space on a molar because of the extra plastic and that mandible, let's say it's a delicofacial profile, they have a steep mandibular plane angle and you're, you're pounding on plastics on the molars, it will compress the ligament space. You'll take the aligners off at their appointment for their check and you'll see that they have an open bite. Literally, you cut those aligners, probably in, in four hours, they're occluding back. You don't need four weeks. It, it happens very, very quickly. Yeah, it's just, it's just allowing the molars to settle. All you've done is compress the PDL space. And physiologically, when you think about it, if you have, you know, it takes up to nine months for PDL to regenerate. If all you've done is compress them, it's just going to take a couple hours for them to settle back in. If that's the reason why you have a POB. So if you've gone four weeks, and I think it's really important to note, if you've gone four weeks, you've cut the, cut the distals of your plastic off, and you've gone four weeks and you still have a POB, it's not from passive intrusion. There's another problem. Correct. Yeah. That, that's probably, yeah, either anti interference or one of the other uh, things we talked about. Right. Excellent. I'm just going to go ahead and check uh, any uh, questions. James saying hello on the live. I'm just going to just see any questions. Okay, so we've got some questions now. Uh, Baron Grutter. Uh, okay, Priyanka's asking, when do you use intranch elastics to extrude and what size elastic we use? So you mentioned that already. So just recap the, 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 the details, which size elastic just for Priyanka again. When I'm going cross arch, I like a five ounce, three quarter, or excuse me, three eighths inch elastic. If I'm going from like a lateral or canine trying to extrude a tooth, cross arch. If you're doing a bootstrap, you want a smaller elastic. One eighth inch, um, you know, that works too. Great. Uh, Jeff Skinner asked about uh, why you want to use a light elastic. Now, I was listening and I've learned something that you want to reduce the friction. Am I right in saying that? Yeah, when, you get, when you're doing a bootstrap, you try to get a big elastic on. You can get it around the button, but when you go on the lingual, that you ended up getting the big rubber between the plastic and the tooth. And in my mind, it seems like that could be a frictional force that we don't want to extrude. A smaller elastic. It's not that I want it to be a light force. It's just that I want a smaller rubber elastic. If I, you know, you can buy uh, one eighth inch elastics in four and a half ounce, that's probably the best way to go. Brilliant. Jeff, I think that answers the question about where the friction is coming from. Yeah. And I, I want to just say that amount of cases that I'm trying to pull down a canine with, um, you know, elastics, it might be one in 50. And really, if there's a their diagnosis, let's say we have a, a, a blocked out canine, number six or 11 is totally blocked out and it's way buckled to the arch. First, you're gonna expand or make room through either IPR, extraction, uh, expansion, something to make space for it. And then the tooth, if, if the root's in the right position, it's not gonna take a lot of force to bring it down. I would use cross arch. All you have to do is remove the, uh, the obstacle for that tooth to erupt into position. Brilliant. Thank you. We're getting a few more questions now, which, which is great. Uh, Stephen Shock, very geeky question. I like it, Stephen, is do you know the name of the paper regarding the inefficiency of interarch elastics? I do. It's, we, we talked about it right at the beginning. Yeah, it's an AGO journal. I wish I could share it. for. Um, it's on the AGO blog. 
I'm going to type it as you say. So AGDO -G blog. AGODO, the American Journal of Orthodox. Yeah, sure. I'm, 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 we're going to link it afterwards. In, in the, when I actually launch this on the main podcast, I'm going to have it in the show notes. But uh, when we can, as soon as we're done, well, one of us will, probably Robin actually, will link it uh, on the actual uh, main feed of this um, as I'm typing it now as well. So we'll make sure we do that. It's a good question. It's good to know, actually. Yeah. Um, so we'll do that later, uh, Robin. Priyanka's asked another question, which is, do you see more molar passive intrusion on dolicocephalic uh, patients? So these are the, the long face patients, right? Yeah, you would imagine that would be the case, especially if um, you're, you're conceptually thinking that it's caused by molars pounding on each other. You would think that a steeper plane angle would, would generate more force on a molar, whereas in a flatter um, parallel to the Frankfurt plane, kind of a flat angled jaw would create less force on the molars. That's what you'd think. But no, I haven't, in, in the hundreds of cases I've done last year, I have not found a correlation between delicofacial and, you know, prognathic profile coincidence between, uh, for passive intrusion of molars. Brilliant. Uh, thanks so much. And Priyanka, thanks so much for answering that question. No, no, no. I see what you mean. But I think that answered the, the question. Uh, so uh, last few bits now, just to wrap up. One is like a, a journey question, right? Like your journey. So you're, you're doing, obviously, a lot of aligner cases, which is great. And uh, I, I love the fact that you're, you're flying the flag for general dentists because you're not a specialist. Have you ever felt that the specialist community has ever looked down on you or, or given you any sort of uh, um, hate in any way because of the, the level of uh, uh, orthodontics that you're doing uh, and that you ever felt any friction amongst the specialists and, and, and the kind of work that you're doing that may be encroaching uh, on that, if, if you know what I mean, with all respect? Absolutely. Um, this is a tricky question. And, and really, I mean, all I have tremendous respect for orthodontics. And at this point in my career now, I've realized how much I don't know. Still to this day, I do get a lot of friction. And sure. there's still a lot that I, I, I can't participate in, even though I want to, because I'm not an orthodontist. I've always thought it was a cottage industry. And they were just trying to keep me out because they didn't want the competition. Um, but realistically, the people, the genuine people, the, the, the good orthodontists have got to know, the real reason that they didn't want general dentists doing a lot of orthodontics is because they understand how complex this is, that you cannot treat patients with a ClinCheck. You have to have x-rays, you have to understand facial growth, you have to understand a lot going on. There's, there's genetic issues you have to take into consideration. There's skeletal, epigenetic issues. I mean, a general dentist takes a weekend course in Invisalign, you could do a lot of harm. So I think that the honest orthodontics were concerned about patients uh, being treated incorrectly and especially growing patients that have a window of opportunity to, to, to correct some of these skeletal problems uh, and, and they would block me out. Now, then there's other ones that are just, you know, angry and, and a little bit bitter for sure. I mean, I, I have many instances where I've had been kicked out of groups or, you know, I had one guy share my name and my face and uh, and orthodontic groups because he thought I was doing harm to dentistry in America and it's like doxing publicly talking bad about me telling him where I live and stuff and it, it can get pretty terrible. Bad. you know but it's interesting because now where I am I have the best relationship with orthodontists in in Texas one of my best friends uh in in Austin um he told me that the biggest windfall he's had to his practice was working with me and training general dentists he gets more referrals I now don't treat complex cases alone. I work in, a, I collaborate. I refer 40% of the patients that come to me seeking orthodontics, not because I don't know how to treat them, but because I don't treat them best or efficiently. I have to do hygiene checks. I'm doing comprehensive orthodontics I'm, or comprehensive treatment planning. I'm doing restorative plans, veneers. He sends me cases to finish. I get cases started, orthognathic surgery cases. I don't you know, adult with a skeletal problem, I, I like to go the surgical route now. I don't set them up surgically. I let the orthodontist do that. Over the years, I've realized what is best for me to do and what isn't. I think that a lot of uh, general dentists get in this and because Invisalign looks like magic, it truly like it's amazing that plastic can do this. Um, they get in over their heads a little bit and I can see why some orthodontics get upset, especially when we got Smile Direct Club and companies like that out there. It's like I, I love the humility and the fact that, you know, you, you admit that, you know, 40 percent of the patients that you might be referring because there, there, are, there are people who, who are more suited for that type of case uh, than where you are. Uh, and I love the fact that 
you, you know, you, you have this great relationship with your local orthodontist. So that that's brilliant. That's exactly what I wanted to hear. I think that's really encouraging. Uh, it's a shame that you went through what you went through, but I, I hear about that happening a lot. In fact, next month in the podcast, I've got like loads of orthodontists I've pre-recorded with. I'm doing a live with you today, but I've got pre-recorded episodes with, uh, with orthodontists. And one of the, the cool conversations I'm having with orthodontists is, when do they think it's okay for GDPs to do treatment which, which some orthodontists would, would classify as compromised, which is such a, a, a dirty word, right? But you know, nothing in life's perfect. And if, if a patient wants, uh, I don't know what the scene is in the US, but in the UK, we come to accept that if someone wants to treat the social six, there is a place for that. Uh, and uh, I, I think as long as you're not doing major harm uh, and you're sort of staying within your boundaries, then there is a place for it in, in Europe. Do you find that there is a, a place for social six orthodontics uh, in, in the US? Just, just, want, just out of interest. I, there's tons of cases that I'm only moving canine to canine, absolutely. But this is the really important thing. You still have to have a diagnosis. You can't just treat patients from a scan or a ClinCheck. If you don't know where the bone is, if you don't know what the face looks like, it's irresponsible. And that's, I think that's the, the big line in the sand is, yeah, I can, if, if someone has number H just sticking out a little bit, it's protruding, there's a little bit of crowding that can be corrected with some minor dental alveolar tipping and realignment, social six ortho is awesome. And there's many, many, many cases that we treat as uh, social six. I think the most important thing in my practice, especially as I mature, is that I first have a diagnosis of functional health. If I know a patient has good occlusion, their function is good, a questionnaire that in advance and a, a quick evaluation confirms that their bite is stable and good and they're not damaging or wearing teeth or causing TMJ problems, yeah, social six ortho, easy and predictable. But if I treat somebody who has got pathology, you know, whether it be a, a bone pathology, there's perio that we use undiagnosed, or a functional pathology, let's say for example, they have a frictional or constricted bite and I throw on some aligners and I make it worse by trying to make a, a very common problem, which is a class, a super class one we call it. They're class one molar, but the incisors are completely retroclined and they're rubbing down their teeth. They have TMJ problems. Basically their mandible has continued to grow. And then you try to straighten out and uncrowd the lower incisors and what you create is more problems, more frictional, more constriction. You know, you, you can't get that from a scan. You have to get that from an actual evaluation of your patient. I was gonna say, there's nothing wrong with a, a class two or class three skeleton. You know, just because you're in a molar class two, if you're functionally healthy, why are we trying to correct that? So an orthodontist, it's like, oh, you're doing limited orthodontics. Well, it's like, okay, well now you started doing distalization of molars or impacting the maxilla or trying to do other things. And now you've created a functional problem. You know, it, sometimes it's better not to open that can of worms. Very well said. And I echo what you want to say because uh, when I started in the Invisalign journey, I realized that I wasn't as hot in my diagnosis as I wanted to be. So then that's when I embarked on my uh, diploma in orthodontics. So that for that reason, that I can really pick and choose my battles a bit like you. I have way more to do to catch up to you, my friend. But um, uh, to pick and choose my battles and to, to learn the art of diagnosis so that I can provide the best care, most efficient care, uh, and the safest care for my patients. And, and I think that's, you know, I think we're, we're seeing from the same hymn sheet there. Uh, also, I just want to say that uh, Kelly Tyrell has said that, I look up at Reb Robin & Co, always a big fan. Uh, if you can do the work, you're an expert in my eyes, uh, and we're all lifelong learners. So that's a very nice yes. sentiment there. Uh, and I think... Also, Matthew Sandra says, well said, brother. It all comes down to proper diagnosis, which is exactly what you're echoing. So that's brilliant. So, so Robin, uh, we're coming to the uh, end of the podcast because we've got the, the part one that we did, take one. I'm going to marry it with this part. So thank you for giving uh, up your time. But can you leave us with two things? The two things I want to leave us with is What's your biggest tip that you haven't already given us? So you've talked about the importance of diagnosis, the elastic stuff. So what's the biggest tip that you haven't already given us because we're very greedy? Uh, uh, and the second thing I want to know is, how can we follow you more? Tell us about your you know, Instagram. The, the, tell us about the Aligner Nation group. Some of my listeners who don't know about the Aligner Nation group, I've been part of it for about two years now. I'm not so much of an active poster. I'm a lurker, but I just love the energy. So please uh, tell us those two things. Well, I want to say, um, you know, Aligner Nation is a community that's been fantastic and it's kind of grown into itself. We have people sharing cases. We have some of the world-leading experts. I mean, Sandra, Sandra Ty is in there commenting. We have 
Maj Musari, we have, you know, Jonathan Nikazisis that all contribute, some of the best of the best in there, and I'm super thankful. But I've been kind of, uh, I've gone a little insular lately. I'm, I'm back to learning again. I'm taking more courses. Um, I'm doing as many cases as I can. This pandemic has increased or my caseload, and I'm learning from everybody else as well. So if you want to learn from me, I mean, there's a lot of platforms that I'm on. I'm always happy to answer any questions, DMs, um, and Alana Nation, so you can follow me there. But the, the last tip I think I've, uh, I'd want to give and is I become more um, prolific in speaking as well as in doing more aligner cases. I, I'd say that the art of aligners is to subdue the patient's concerns with as little effort as possible and make it simple. Always start with the teeth that don't need to move first. And what I mean by that is look at a patient's smile, their face with a full Duchenne exaggerated smile. Look at where the teeth are, find out, hey, does eight, are eight and nine in the right place? If they are in the right place, right click on a ClinCheck, don't move them. Move the rest of the teeth to those reference teeth. I don't like to move molars if someone's functionally healthy. Leave them alone, right click those, make them unmovable. And then when it comes to the bicuspids, canines, things like this, especially lateral incisors, we know it's very difficult to extrude a lateral incisor. We know that. Ask yourself, does it need to extrude? Is the gingival zenith where you want it to be? And if it is, I would rather trust my you know, composite skills and make it longer than try to pull it down and pull the gums down with it, get an uneven gingival uh, zenith profile, especially someone who shows their gums as a high risk, you know, to show a gummy smile. Um, I would rather do some bonding. So make your aligners easier and don't try to tackle every case. You submit a case and you get a clin check back and they're doing skeletal changes and it, you know, you, it looks like a miracle just happened. It's probably not the case you want to take. You want to control the variables, not move as many teeth. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. Uh, Robin, thank you so much for, for giving up your time again. I know you're a busy guy. So honestly, it's, it's great to connect with you from across the pond. Uh, I'm going to get this out on the podcast very soon as well so that the main listeners can listen to it. But thank you so much for, for adding to the conversation, uh, giving your expertise on aligners and sharing those little tips and tricks that we really struggle with uh, with elastics. But you really shocked me in the sense that actually uh, intermaxillaries don't have as big of a place in the line as that I, I thought they did. Uh, and to be fair with you, I'm so happy that I can put away my, my buttons and, and elastics now. So I thank you for that. But I'm going to focus more after today's chat. I'm going to focus even more on nailing the diagnosis and picking the right battles. And also, I'm going right, to start right-clicking more and start not moving teeth more as well, as you said at the end. So thank you so much, Robin, for coming today. I really appreciate it, my friend. Of course. Thank you so much. Look forward to doing this again. You're the best. Guys, thank you so much for listening all the way to the end. I hope you found the value from Dr. Robin Bethel. Uh, he gave some great tips, especially at the end when I asked him for his top tip, like some of those gems he gave were phenomenal. Uh, and it's, it's, it's almost like sad to hear his struggles, quote unquote struggles and sort of frustrations and, and how he was almost defamed by an orthodontist. But these are the struggles that a lot of general dentists face. And I'm hoping I've covered a lot of those themes this month in orthodontic month. And I hope you gain a lot of value from orthodontic month. So if you know someone who's start, starting out orthodontics and this episode series this month has all helped them, please do share it with them. And as always, join the Protrusive Dent Community Facebook page and leave me a review if you thought this was valuable. I'll catch you in the next episode, guys. Thank you so much for listening all the way to the end. Yeah.